Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John. This is many of and welcome back to Thrones of Britannia and back to the concept art. Yes, yeah, sorry, it's another one of those videos where I've got ten minutes to show you a faction. So as a result, I get to show you a little bit more Thrones of Britannia, but we're certainly not wasting any of that ten minutes on just the intro screen. Oh no, no, no! So Thrones of Britannia was looking very exciting the last time I played it. They've just pushed back its release slightly. It was going to be late April. They just pushed it back to May the third, which fortunately gives me another chance to actually play the thing and this time I get to show you a brand new faction I wasn't actually able to show you the last time I played this which is lovely and that's one of the two playable factions that plays rather differently to all the others the Viking Sea Kings and to be precise Dublin I know that doesn't look like it should say Dublin but it's called Dublin in game and probably just in general don't think too hard about how words are pronounced in the 9th century and the reason I chose Dublin, suppose the other faction I could have gone with, who live over, that's them on the minimap, way up there, is I think Dublin actually starts off with a really interesting, which is a very difficult position. Because your territory is divided between this little island over here and this area over here. So as a result, you're spread pretty thin. The other problem is diplomatic, or to be precise, cultural, because I'm a Viking Sea King, and I'm surrounded by people who aren't. So if we just look at the relationship map here, you'll see the people to the north of me, to the west of me, and to the south of me are all red, indicating they don't really like me, because they are culturally Gaelic and I'm culturally not. This map rather does help me pick my first target, however. This guy down here and this guy over here are probably a bit big for me for the time being, so probably best I actually head north and pick off these little guys. First things first, however, the game always starts you with a little rebel army in your territory, just need to clear them out. So he goes down nice and quickly, but that also provides me with a very, very important bonus, which is when you kill that rebel army, you officially succeed a mission that gives you internal stability. That gives you plus 50% unit replenishment. Basically, the game gifting you the ability to build up a new army from scratch nice and quickly in the first five turns. The game gives us a choice at this point. The faction to the north is so weak, we can just basically demand they submit, and they would just join us immediately without having to bother conquering them. However, that's going to cause unhappiness. Happiness is already going to be enough of a problem in this territory. I think instead we should take them by force, not least as the Sea Vikings unique mechanics really encourage you to be waging war as much as you can. Understandably, they're not best happy with that and have immediately invaded. However, their army looks like it is extremely weak. As a result, even though we're outnumbered 11 to 6, there's a good chance we can win this one. However, if we're very, very lucky indeed, yes, the general's just leveled up, which might help give us an edge. Interesting changes the last time I played this, they've actually made the quartermaster a bit worse. He used to start giving you, yeah, I think at level 2, a reduction in your army's upkeep, which meant I would always basically give all my generals quartermasters, so they've actually made him a little bit less powerful, which is actually a nice touch. And also, that makes the champion a lot more appealing. The champion will give me extra command, and in addition, extra melee skill for my commander's unit, which actually isn't cavalry for the Sea Vikings. It's a group of really, really hardcore infantry. Indeed, our full strength units means we just outnumber them, but it's still going to be tricky. I've spread my line out nice and wide here, just to make sure they don't flank us, because they've got the cavalry advantage. That's going to be your leader right there, because you actually get, yeah, proper cavalry for your general. If we could pick this guy off, that would probably be a good way to do it. Now, those guys are going to come charging in, but I'm not too worried about them. They also like yelling a lot, by the way. I would like my archers to potentially focus on, you stop skirmishing too, if at all possible. Everyone should probably be focusing on, uh, yeah, the actual general. If we can take him out, that'd be marvellous, and flaming arrows work particularly well against cavalry. Now they're holding firm for the time being, which works for me. There we go. Starting to get some nice early shots in on those guys. And my javelinman doing some lovely damage over here as well. And this is just perfect. Their generals run forward straight into a shield castle. He is really going to struggle to make progress there. The enemy general is dead. Exactly what I wanted to see. The enemy generals collapse and that's going to be a big morale penalty for everyone else. Problem is they've still got cav and I don't. So as a result, we've got a bit of a problem. Not least as their skirmishes are still hitting my front line. Probably best at this point to pop out of our shield castles and just get involved. And my lads start charging forwards. This small unit of just a basic spear warband will chase off these skirmishes while my general starts rolling up the line here. So we can just head over here, head into the back of these guys, and yeah, my elite general with that upgraded champion will tear these bastards apart. They're already wavering. And my general rolls up the line, and that looks like it's pretty much good night for this faction. 
Now, the other reason I actually wanted to fight those guys rather than just absorbing them was the slavery mechanic, which kind of works like a simplified version of the slavery of the Dark Elves in Warhammer 2. Win battles, take big cities in particular, and go into the raiding stance in enemy territory, and your number of slaves goes up. The more slaves you've got, the happier empire is, and also the more money you're getting on a turn-to-turn -turn basis. Worrying signs to the south, as Yas, my little Celtic southern neighbour, has actually brought his army up here to Naz. If he tries to attack Dublin itself, the garrison there will probably be strong enough with wall defences to see him off, but... Yeah, this little sub-region here could potentially be in trouble. Not much I can do now, though. Until I've actually secured more food, I can't train another army. So as a result, it's a pretty high priority to get up here, because conveniently, that's actually sitting on a farm and a fishery, both of which will actually provide me with the food I need to expand the armed forces. Annoyingly, that tiny force could, in theory, go and seize this port. So just in case, I'm just going to get a new general here, just to make sure I've got something to defend the area. Yep, as I feared, he is going to try and go straight over there. And it's going to be his 18 men versus my 30. So I made a good call deploying that guy. And hopefully, we can just about win this. This is pretty much a coin flip, to be honest. It's whichever general happens to fall first. In fact, I'd say this is looking very good. I've got 22 guys, and he's down to four. The enemy general is dead! And the enemy general falls, and we managed to pull it off. So that was a very good tactical decision by me to save the town. Taking the first of their two settlements also gives me access to a new farm. I can start training some units, which is good, because I'm worried about this guy down here. So just in case, I'm going to deploy that general who just did very, very well for himself over here to Dublin and start training a new army. And without any problem at all, the rest of the province falls to us, leaving us in a very good food position. Now the next thing to figure out is where I need to go next, because I am surrounded by potential enemies. Ah, now this is just what I wanted to see. The Irish kingdoms have all ended up in a nice big war versus each other. So these lads to the north of me are attacking these lads and these lads. Now that's hopefully going to keep Mead busy and their attention off me. Which needs to be choosing between marching north and marching south. South, however, brings me closer towards the other Viking kings who live on the Irish south coast. Now, they are much more likely to be very friendly to me indeed. And yes, indeed, they already like me, even though we've barely had anything to do with each other. We are, however, going to need something to defend our northern frontier. Because I can't help but notice an army of ten right up here. So probably time for a little swapsy roundy. So the army I just trained needs to start heading north and guarding our northern frontier while my main lad starts heading south. A few turns later and things are looking a bit difficult here. We've already started building up a decent army, the Giant Slayer's good name over here in Dublin, but these guys know it's coming. They've started hunkering down over in Nass pretty damn hard and they've got the city's garrison to help them out too. So, new plan, this army is instead going to march south here and start attacking these undefended areas. Either it will pull this guy out to try and take us on, or he'll try and counter-invade. If he does, I'm going to have this force move down here, together with the garrison in Dublin, it should be able to hold him off. However, that leaves the north very, very exposed. Just before I moved in, however, good news. One of the Sea Vikings to the south has actually gone and smashed into one of those territories, pulling their army south in a hurry. Best thing I can do now is probably send my little force down here to go and attack this little sub-settlement, which you can 100% get to next turn. Marvellous. Leave my main force here, ready for their main army to actually loop down over here to reclaim this settlement. The moment that happens, I can basically go over here, put this place under siege, and take it before they can get back. And looks like my plan worked perfectly. This territory has fallen back into their hands, but that means they're now far too far south to stop me engaging in a little bit of a land grab. So, quick jump in here, that's a nice quick easy to have, and that territory falls to me, and indeed that also gives me visibility of their army. Meaning this force is now ready to come over here and just walk into the city. Well, not quite walk in, there's still the garrison, but yeah, we can easily build some stuff overnight here, no way they can stop us. So next big question, where's this guy planning to move between turns? And the answer is, he's heading south. Okay, it's possible he's basically considering this territory a bit of a lost cause, so instead he's- Ooh! 
He's losing territory left, right, and centre. I suspect he knows that everything's a lost cause up here, so instead, he's going down south to get revenge on the guys who attacked this land. And if he is deciding to naff off south, well, why not just send this force down here and keep claiming some more territory for me? And with as many axmen as I've got on my side, the battle's a mere formality. We can just walk straight into their town. That gets us a huge influx of slaves, meaning that, yep, we've now got up to 500 gold every turn from the slaves. And that opens up all sorts of possibilities for what I could do next. Of course, this territory is up for grabs, and this territory represents, that is, ooh, iron. Good little money maker there. The extra food and money could also go into training a new army to guard the north, because the north is looking very, very vulnerable indeed. Or potentially I could start looking at my Irish neighbours and consider expanding in that direction. But I strongly suspect that's all the time I've got, ladies and gentlemen. I strongly suspect my ten minutes are up. But I am glad I got to show you how the flow of an early game goes in Thrones of Britannia. And yes, indeed, I am still very impressed Two things I noticed in particular, it looks like they've kind of fixed a little bit since the last version I played, which is, yeah, they've rebalanced some of the companions, so I think now it's a bit more of an interesting choice between which of the actual retinue you want to take with you. I appreciate that. And also, the cavalry pathfinding seems a bit better. The cavalry seemed weirdly slow in the last version I played. Now they actually seem to move around a lot more smoothly and quickly. So I'm glad whatever was going wrong there appears to have been fixed as well. So yes, indeed, this is just looking better and better. As soon as I can get my hands on the full version, rest assured you will be seeing a full playthrough. And hopefully that will be very, very soon indeed. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd. And this has been another little preview of Thrones of Britannia. Thank you very much and goodbye. No, this no, this no, guy's no. enjoying that. This guy's enjoying his elephant a bit too much. Oh my god. In Fair Verona, we set our scene. Oh my god, Becky. Look at her butt. It is so big. They've managed to glitch inside one of the buildings. Elephants in the rear! And then oh, in come the chariots! Yeah.